one second right. here. Just um, uh, basically, um, he backed it up with a lot of data. Everything he talked about, the data was on the website. So a lot of people. Um, there you go, Skyfog. Okay, so what you're seeing is the fortunate thing that uh, he, he saved all these as photographic images because his website's no longer there. Again, it's the, the old topic of information disappearing from the, from the web, why you really want a book. Okay, so down below there is the number of minutes um with it and he tells you how to go and go through the procedure to, to so where'd you get this if it's not on the web anymore it's it's part it's of a, a photo share network oh okay. okay so if you go to the top part um i i spent an entire night going through all his photographs including personal one he has photographs from when he went to um a um, Christian school in Oman um, that was sort of like a, an American school, okay, and kept track with all his classmates through the years from, you know, he was like a teenager up until, I guess he passed away when he was like in his late 60s, early 70s. And so um, he really um, kept track, you know, it was interesting to see how him and his friends aged and the one before he passed away he said well two guys passed away and you know it was instead of young sprightly people it was you know a bunch of old guys in traditional clothing and two of them were in the uh uh in wheelchairs okay just to show you you know actuary uh, tables don't lie <laughs> you know people People pass on. Okay, so you found something. I don't think that I've seen that. You, you found something else. So, so Jerry, Mike, Mike brought this up because he's going to do uh, his windy observatory group uh, talk about light pollution. He thinks. Okay. And and how to determine it. And what Samir said um, was, "Hey, I can go back to my old photographs." and click on the area where the, the, the subject isn't. And I can determine from the length of the photograph and the F number, what the sky brightness was at that time from those formulas, which I think was pretty yeah. good. How you doing, Hank? Pretty good, you? Yeah. Okay, I see you got a haircut. Uh, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, we, we can tell when people get brave enough to go outside. Uh, you know, from, you know, yeah, it, it took me six months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have my haircut appointment on Thursday. Well, actually what I did and uh, my, my wife didn't like it because it was a mess. I did my own hair for a while. I had a, I had a, a beard like Jerry. And uh, when COVID started, I shaved it all off and, uh, uh, because I felt that the, it, the air was getting around the mask and the hair. So I had this, this shaver, had nothing to do with, so I decided to cut my hair when my wife wasn't around. <laughs> You're lucky my wife cut my hair after six months. I was starting to get a good ponytail, but she didn't like it. Then yeah. three months later, she cut the other side of my hair. So. Oh, the other side of the head? The other, yeah, the other. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to go and shave, not shave it, but, uh, you know, do a buzz and all Mohawk. that. And then I started looking at my hair and going, oh, yeah. well, I don't want to get sunburned. Um, so um, anyways, um, so I'm going to talk about that. But Samir was a, a pretty good guy. Um, uh, and uh, had a lot to say, you know, um, you know, yet another person who's no longer with us that really put up a lot on the web in the beginning, you know, some good information. So if you go to that website with a, a 
photographs are, there's other subjects that he talks about. And uh, although um, quite a bit of information is still missing, but he had a lot of good um, comparison photographs showing things. Um, no doubt there's other places you can find that information. So uh, Hank, uh, I noticed you talked about um, dome control. Uh, I have some good, some somewhat good news. I got my dome control software working, but it's not perfect, but at least it works. And what I discovered was that the ASCOM driver didn't li like the uh, uh, numbers I put in. I kind of like, I said, well, this should work. Well, it didn't. <laughs> okay. So, so, but one one of the things with these uh, you, you had a good point on the, uh, the the fact that she should go to stepper motors and they just dis discussed the fact that if you've got a large enough stepper motor it's not going to slip okay right um, oh a, another thing what I did was <clears throat> the driver did not allow me to zero out the count when I had it pointing north um, they were assuming that you're always going to put the motor right at north, okay, and didn't allow you the fact that maybe you want to put your motor to the south like I did because of the prevailing winds. When mm. it's stowed, I want it to be pointing away from the west and from the north because of the, uh, way, the way the rain comes. So the rain only hits a solid part rather than the door. And so what I wound up doing was taking, popping the dome up and rotating it while <laughs> the, the counter said- Foolet is which way north, huh? What? Foolet is to which way is north, huh? That's right. So I popped it up and while it was at zero, which is due north, um, I rotated right. it and put it down and then it started working, okay, reasonably well, but it's still off by a couple of degrees and the one thing that they really don't talk about and i don't think any of the vendors talk about is if your mount slightly off centered from from the center and if if your mount moves the telescope in it, it like like my mount okay the axis you know where the declination is a little bit you can't really measure it that well because you're measuring through solid objects you know and it um a lot of times they want you to be accurate to about less than an inch in order to to move the dome properly but they don't allow you to put in little tweaky fudge factors you know huh. that you could say oh well you're close but just move it just a little bit and and make a model of it like they do with telescope mounts. So I've got to go and work on that, but at least I got it working. The the shutter um, still doesn't work and the guy hasn't come back to me. And then I had the unfortunate thing that I unplugged the charger, plugged it back in. Now the charger doesn't work. So I might be taking, I might be taking the, the shutter motor off unless I uh, 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 get a new charger for it or fix the old charger. What um, kind of charger are you using, Mike? Well, what he did was he took like a three amp uh, charger for um, an automotive and put special tags on it. Uh, it's kind of unique where it's got magnets and um, on on uh, braided wire and so they hang down and then when it uh, it goes by it it goes you know uh, onto the magnets um so i'm gonna have to look into that um it's still got a charge there are other ways of charging it by um putting a, another charger on there i've got i got something that's exactly designed for jail cells that i got from rtmc about 
30 years ago that I could use on there. But it's not convenient the way that it is that when you home it, uh, the things make contact and charge the, uh, the motor. Um, but uh, anyway, do you use a, uh, you use a trickle charger? It's a, it's like a it's a two step charger. It floats the, the battery afterwards. You can tell. Um, another thing uh, for the furtherment of my astronomical telescope making projects. I don't have it here, but is it reading right side for you or not? Yeah, for not yeah. correct. Okay, for, for me, it looks backwards. Um, I got myself a new router, a plunge router, and I, you know, I decided that um, uh, the, 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 the DeWalt's have, uh, this model comes with both the, the normal base and then the plunge base, which is what you need for oh, I, cutting I circles. So it was a bit pricey, but it's it's two tools in one. It's made really well. So hopefully- Threw me I, for a loop. I thought you were talking about an internet um, router. Oh, I, I didn't know DeWalt made one. <laughs> well, in this day of Zoom, that might mean it, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's a full size, full size, like a horse and a half? Two horse or a laminate trimmer? It's a, it's like 12 and a half amp motor. And okay. the, the reason why I got this one is it's one of the few has a soft start. In other words, yep. it doesn't go like that and screw things up when you turn it on. Yeah, soft so, start's nice. Yeah. So Mike, so, what does that cost? <laughs> <laughs> 200 okay so yeah. you know the, the single routers are like 150 so the other yeah i mean you know it's it's probably about double the price of the of the cheapy one but yeah but you get you know the, uh, for a router that's for a router with two bases with a regular base and then a plunge base yeah that's that's pretty decent yeah and it, 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 it also came with the alignment tools, a special alignment tool for the bases. I already got the circle cutters and the other things. So um, where they get you are on the bits. The bits are expensive. I have bits. I, I still have some bits. Um, there's a special bit I've been looking at that's sort of like it's it's kind of a weird curve, but what you can what it does, it allows you to make a 45 interlocking uh, corner without dados or anything like that. It's it's along the the board edge rather than on you know the various points where they, they fit together. You know what I mean? Oh nice. And so um, I'll get that. That's probably going to be a, a fifty dollar bit, but that would allow me to put together um, yeah there you go Rockler. Yeah. Okay. So it's one of my. <laughs> the the only thing that you have to worry about that is proper depth alignment to get that proper so that when you put the two pieces together, they form. But this is something that would uh, make a really great joint. That's yeah. A a really. You're really good, Tim, at uh, finding these things. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom's doing this. Yeah. Tom, Tom. Okay, yeah. Uh, anyways, um, so um, so you don't need to do um, the, 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 the dados um, and you don't need to do the um, uh, biscuits, you know, if you really want to get a super joint or other things. So Now you need a router cable. Uh, you build that out of wood. With yeah. The router. Yeah. That'll make that'll make that job a lot lot easier yeah. to handle. Yeah. So so anyways, that's um, that'll help me go and finish up the fourteen and a half inch. If I'm not gonna, um, I I think after this year I'm gonna go and get rid of all the. Uh, the trash uh, 
uh, stuff uh, and uh, put it in a decent box that will go together really well. Uh, right now, that the COVID scope is uh, requires definitely the Yukon. We'll take up most of the Yukon in the back. And, uh, so with a decent rocker box and all that, you know, it'll fit in a small car. I hope it. I hope it will. Anyways. So Tim, yeah. did you want to get into the Tom Farr uh, telescope that you discovered? Sure, that, that's fine. I also have those wonky patterns. I'd like uh, Mike and, and Jerry to take a look at as well. Okay. And, and uh, I didn't do any. I didn't do any other work on the mirror. I was. I decided to wait until you guys saw this, okay. and um, I'll tell you what I have in mind for that. But if uh, if you want to start with Tom Farr, that's great. I'll, I'll I'll just I'll I'll start right now if you want, and I'll just start talking about it. Uh, okay, Chuck, hold on. Chuck got contacted by a guy that uh, works at JPL or did work at JPL. And I think he did a presentation for the AU on a Mars mission a few years back. So uh, his dad back in the 60s made an eight inch reflector telescope. And as you know, back in the 60s, there wasn't a lot of availability of uh, resources or, or, or parts that we have today. So when he put these things together, they were just kind of, here it is right here, there's his scope. Now, I don't know where he got that base from, but that's Tom Farr there, went out to his house uh, and um, he wanted me to help him to collimate it. So before we did this, I just said, look, you know, he, you know, Chuck had contacted him. He wanted to know where to get it uh, illuminized. And I said, well, we used to do stuff with Bob Bees, but I went to his website and it said that he was ill and not doing it anymore. Well, Tom, Tom, when I talked to Tom Farr about it, he said, you know, I saw that on, on the website and I decided to just take a, a gamble and I emailed him. And um, Bob Fees returned the, the call and said, yeah, I was sick, but I'm thinking about getting back into it. You'll be my first co customer. So he sent the mirror off. So his dad made an, uh, it to me, I measured it out to be a, a, about an F7 uh, from about where the mirror cell is to the, uh, you know, to the, to the, uh, <clears throat> where the diagonal is, was about 48 inches. And then I took about another eight inches out to where I figured the, the focal plane would be. And then together, the 56, you know, times eight, I'd said this was an F7 mirror approximately. And, uh, there's several things about this scope. It, it being an old heavy clunker, uh, I thought, well, you know, a lot of these things are put together with plumbing parts and, you know, they, they just didn't have a lot of good stuff. I would say that the, the downside on this scope is the finder you can see. It's, just, it's, it's not a, a right angle finder, but it works. It's got a lot of adjustments on it. And the focuser. The focuser is a one and a quarter inch uh, focuser. It is not that good because uh he has i think some old celestron eyepieces and the back focus on that thing almost popped it out of the tube it was way you know way it was way way too much travel and it doesn't have a thumb screw to tighten against the the eyepieces so fortunately the, the tube is in a position where you know you're not, yeah. not going to have anything falling out that's a and focus yes. that was sold by edmund scientific or celestra or uh, criterion yeah, I have I have that same focuser. You guys yeah. gave that to me when I was making my star tester, battery along with a um, a diagonal mirror. Yeah, you know the the the, the odd thing was, and, and again about this scope, you know, it didn't it didn't look like much when you first looked at it, but the more I got into it, the more I was just amazed by it. The guy did a really fabulous job on it. I mean, even the focuser being a little clunky focuser, you could put a, any eyepiece in there and it fit. It wasn't too, too tight. It wasn't too loose. It was just right. Because it's and spring loaded. No, it wasn't. It, it, the, just, it was just that it was just friction fit. Yeah, well, if you take a look at the top of it, it's sort of like got little dimples. It's it presses right there. That's sort of. Oh, okay. Those are okay. the springs. Yeah. That might be what helped it because I yeah. mean, it, 
it, they they really they really just sat in there real nice. And um, F F eight, uh, you know, F7. just about any eyepiece would work, and uh, the alignment is less critical. Yeah. We put we took I I I. I told Tom, let's take a look. I was talking about Jerry Wilson. I said, you know, Jerry does it without any of these collimating tools. He just does it by eye. And I said, oh, how? He even showed me, and I still don't know how. But I said, one thing we want to do is look down the focuser and, and get that, you know, get the mirror centered in the view through the focuser. Let's get that centered. That was looked to me to be dead on. One thing about the base here, when you look at that, that picture, he had setting circles in there. And he just, he... You know, he's got, he said, I always wanted to wonder, my dad never put it on, but I was wondering if I could attach motors to it. And I said, well, I don't know about that. It'd be something you probably could do, but take a lot of effort. But the, the you know, the base and, and the, the, the altitude azimuth adjustments, they were pretty cool. They were, they were really smooth. You just loosen the knobs and man, they moved really easy. Those, the are balance. The Those are the declination and right ascension. Yes. Yeah. Blocks. The altitude and azimuth is that bolt on the flange you see in the middle of the mount there. Up, that's the level. Up a little bit. Up, up right there. Oh, that's, really? That's yeah. You have to loosen that, and then you have to somehow hold it in the right place, and then lock it down real tight. When, and that's which, to, for the polar uh, for the altitude. Yeah, it's for the uh, latitude. Our latitude. Our latitude. Yeah. Which, um, what you would do is one of those legs appears to have a, uh, um, a faucet Level. handle on. Yeah. I would have turned it such that the telescope uh, axis faces there. Then you could fine tune the. Uh, uh, yeah. but there's actually two of those. There's actually two of those. Oh, okay. So two of, two of the legs you could adjust. And the, the weight, the counterweight is just. You just didn't want to mess with it. It won't slide up or down. It's just set. But you could loosen the the bands on the tube and slide the tube up or back to balance it if you wanted to. So that was another nice thing about it. It just you know he just looked into the, those little tiny details were all there. So I mean you could probably you'd have to have a little screwdriver handy, but you could loosen it and then slide the tube up or back and then tighten it back up again. Or I told him just get some Velcro and put it on the tail end of the of the uh, tube and then stick some weights on it whenever you needed them for counterbalance. Inside the scope at the spider, um, I can tell you that for sure there was there's been several scopes that absolutely drive me nuts. And one of them was donated to Westmont that we got uh, in the center of this one. It had a bolt. You can see where there's a, a bolt coming through and then a nut. And then usually in some of these really horrible diagonal holders, there's like a screw there and you loosen the screw and then the, the whole diagonal, it, it kind of, uh, it gimbals around. And then oh, you no it. way. And then you retighten it. And then the other thing is the screws behind it, you can barely see the screws behind the, uh, the upper plate there. And in behind there were some pretty ugly looking screws in behind. But let me tell you something. We got a long screwdriver and we went in there. I put my laser collimator in and he, I told him before I come out, I want you to put a paper ring on, on the center of the mirror and place it there. I told him how to do it mm -hmm. that, that, to make it a really That's accurate a better point. Yeah. And he did that. Uh, you can't really see it, but in the center of his mirror there, there's one spot that the alumina, uh, the aluminum coating was just gone. And I said, what is that? And he said, oh, my dad was really pissed off when he was making, when he ground and polished the mirror, there was a bubble. And so huh. he went through the bubble and he said, there's nothing I can do about it. And I said, well, don't worry about that. It, the diagonal is kind of covering it. To me, the diagonal looks a little small for the scope, but who knows? It, it, the views we got of the mountains were pretty cool. Um, I think that the, he adjusted, his dad adjusted the spider arms so that it was fairly over the, the mirror, dead center over the mm -hmm. mirror. Mm -hmm. So we put the laser in there and we got, I was showing them the, the dots. We, we, uh, we saw that, that uh, center dot over the, the paper ring and putting that, putting that uh, the screwdriver 
in those on those three screws and fooling around with them. It was counterintuitive. Instead of you would think, okay, if I screw them counter, if I if, say the screw to the right, not the, not those, but on the, behind oh. the die holder. If you screw one to the clockwise, you would think it's going to push the diagonal to the left. And it was counter to that. I just didn't get that, why I was getting a counter uh, into it. But anyway, regardless, I just played with the, the screws and that red dot really, really um, just walked right over that center ring, just beautifully. There was It wasn't like all these newer scopes that have all these gimbaled screws that are just crappy this thing moved really well and then uh when we start when we started to do this the other collimation where you get the return of the collimation dot and you, you want to center that in your in, in your uh your diagonal to close the loop uh at first i thought that we were that they were right on top of each other and i was wrong because you can tell that when you put your head behind the the tube there and all of a sudden your eye gets hit with the laser you the laser know. yeah so i just said okay we got to find this thing it's somewhere out there so we went behind the tube and you saw those screws behind here's another thing that was great about the scope these there was no screws that had a locking screw to lock it in place yeah this guy put these he put these real heavy screws in there and they're spr they're spring loaded on the mirror cell on the inside but it it was such that you could you could turn them one way or the other and walk, once you found that red dot in there you could move it just walk it right back over that that center ring so that so that the optical axis was was right on and it worked great i mean this old clunky looking telescope just had great adjustment and it was like butter you could just play with it and now to top it all off i said well where'd you get the tube and he said he made it and they got, this sucker made this out of fiberglass back in the 60s. And it's a beautiful job. It's nice and smooth. It's, it doesn't seem that heavy. But how he did that, I have no clue. It, but it, it's, a, it's a fabulous scope. We took the thing. We put some eyepieces in it. And we looked up at the mountains and, and, uh, and got it focused on them. And, it, you know, that, it's a pretty cool little scope. So um, in, in the end of all this, you know, he, he told me I'm going to be giving this away to some like a niece or nephew or something. So he's not even going to keep it himself. And uh, I thought he might even show up tonight to talk a little bit about it. And when his dad doing the making the scope. But he said he was about six years old when all this happened. And, uh, you know, it, it's it it, uh, it surprised me. It surprised me. It was a it's a fabulous little scope. The guy did a. It, it doesn't look like much, but God, it's it's not bad, not bad. Uh, I was pretty pretty impressed. I never liked the mirror those mirror locks on the primary anyway. I never use mine. I just leave them loose, and you know it seems to do better that way. I think less likely to get mirror pinch or something like that. Oh yeah. yeah. I've never put them on any of the scopes I've built either. Yeah, yeah, I just leave them loose. Yeah, there, it, it, it just this thing, this thing, it, it, like I said, the only downside I saw to this thing to me is what he, he's fixing the fixing the finder. That's nothing. You could that you can fix easy. Just put a put a right angle on it and it's ready to roll. Mm -hmm. um, and the finder, all he had to do is really adjust that. It was pretty. It was pretty close to being on, but. These screws in the back of the cell, they don't look like much, but they're real heavy threads and nice big, I think they're larger than a quarter. I think they're like three eighths uh, screws and slotted like that. I don't know where he found those parts, but they're really nice. And, um, you know, I think threaded through the back plate, that's amazing too. So, but it, it surprised me. The fact that he had that little, those three little screws on the diagonal holder that just they just adjusted like butter and these screws in the back they adjusted i told him hey you know what tom if you get one of those little cheapy laser collimators on amazon for about 20 bucks they have the little right angle or the diagonal uh spider web looking gizmo that you can go behind the scope and you know once you get the once you get the laser over the center paper ring you can go behind and just adjust it until you get the return on that little 45 uh, 
uh, thing that you can look at at the back of the scope. This thing would be a piece of cake to call a mate. So, that, so that's the thing about, about visiting him. I don't think there was anything else I wanted to mention about it, except that, uh, um, you know, he was, he had an eight, he had an eight inch old Celestron there that you could see and wanted to know how to collimate that. And I said, look, that's not, that's not really down my lane. I'm not really good at that. And he, I said, you could talk to Jerry, you can talk to Art Harris, you know, you could talk to, you know, any of the guys in the club would know how to do that. But I showed him the three little screws on the back of the corrector and said, you know, you can do it by eye, really. If you, if you get a, a star in your, a bright star in your, uh, and you center it and go ahead and take a look at it, just make it to, so it's, you know, just those three screws. So it's nice and tight circle. And that might be pretty close, but <clears throat> it was, that was a cool little Celestron that he got from years back. The owned orange orange tube one, so you know he had he had some nice little toys there, and that's the that's the episode of Tom Farr. I thought it was a pretty cool one. Yeah, looked like a good project back in the day. Oh yeah, I mean for the sixties, this guy did a job on it, man. Yeah, the mount looks like it was an early cave or coast instruments. Uh. So Tim, I just wanted to show your binocular mount that Don French is donating back to the club. That Tim made this uh, binocular mount, and uh, Don French uh, just no longer wants to keep all his telescope stuff, so he's donating a bunch of stuff back to the club. So it looks yeah, really that, nice, Tim. Yeah, it's a shame that that happened. He was all excited about this. I don't know what happened there. Um, I think he's having trouble. He's moving changed. stuff around a couple times. He's what in a small Jerry? apartment. He changed it. He's changed his mind a couple times on astronomy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, by the time I made this and, and sent it over to him, I, uh -huh. I just said, you know, I have, I put, I, I put, the, I put the mirror on. Um, and I can't, I can't remember if it was double sided sided tape or if it was siliconed on i don't even remember but uh, the guys when i was i was still down at the lab then and these guys just gave me a big piece of mirror that and uh and put it on for me huh. it's a back coated mirror it's not front surface uh i so tom totten asked me if that made a difference and i said for what we're looking at i don't think so you know if you're going to look at the moon or star clusters i didn't think it made a big difference I'm with you. I thought it might give some double images because of that, but. Yeah, we, we took a look at, I think we took a look at terrestrial stuff around when I got it done. When I got it done, I tested it with some uh, 10 by 50 binoculars I had and I, I mounted it just like he has his here. And I, I told him, look, if you have seven by 50, 10 by 50, even 15, uh, by 70, it still might. <laughs> but it, but certainly the 10 by 50s worked perfect. They were it was it was no big deal. And the way I made it, it you can see that the the little uh, wing nut on the back. I can't remember how that works, but you can take the you can take the thing apart. <laughs> and uh, part of the part of the part of the the uh, the real work on this was getting the 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 uh, um, attachments on it on the wings on the side where the knobs are, getting those spaced just perfectly, and I have washers on the inside of that, and those those washers I had to I had to put those in there and capture them with these knobs, and that was a real chore. But I got it done, and uh, by the time I was done with that, you could tighten these knobs down and get a, a nice stitching to them, so you could set it in one position and move, loosen them, set it to, so you can see something else. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't think Don had a real good time with it because he, uh, I think he was thinking it was gonna be easy. And, I, and for him, I don't, I don't, for some reason, I didn't think it was. But uh, by the time he kept calling me back and saying, what do I do about this? I, I just said, look, you know, get, get one of those arms that you can, put yourself in a chaise lounge or a nice 
comfortable chair and, and you just pull the, the arm over to you and move it around. And I said, that, that would be the best thing for you. That way he could just sit himself down and look at one, look at the sky, pretty much a lot of it, but and get up now and then and move the chair around. But, but, uh, but this was, this was an interesting project. It was fun. <clears throat> Did that track the stars too? Is that what the deal is with the mount there and everything? It just, if, uh, if you put, if you put the, if, if you got the thing to track, I, I don't see why it wouldn't, but yeah. You know, huh. But I mean, he had, he had just a real light tripod and that's, that's it in my backyard, testing it out. I just put that on an, on an old Manfrotto, real lightweight Manfrotto. And I had a nice little pan, uh, you know, the pan head on it so I could move it around real quick. Huh. And, and my wife was digging, looking at the tree up overhead with the bird, the bird nest into the hawk's nest. <laughs> oh, there you go. You can use yeah, it for bird watching. Yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of interesting. Uh, there's the, there's the one that he wanted me to make him that. And um, I think I did make something for him. Yeah, you this made a block little, with that with the huge with that U bolt. You made a block like yeah. that. Yeah, I remember exactly. something like that. And, and there was like a there's like a little U shaped piece of wood there. You can in black, yeah. and then that that U bolt goes over the top of a typical uh, uh, um, what do you call it an extension arm on any tripod. Um, he he just couldn't he couldn't tell me exactly what size of an of an arm he had. So I just guessed and went down and bought a U-bolt to, to match that. And then you buy this little flex, clear flexing tube and shove it over the U-bolt and you're done. And then again, I think underneath there were wing nuts that you could tighten and it'll, it'll tighten on your, on your uh, extension arm. And I said, there you go. You can, now you can sit in your chair and, and take a look. But he didn't get that done because the end of the arm where you can see the knob attached to the binoculars he had a little trouble with that one and i just couldn't help him on that I, it, it, and we were right in the middle of COVID. i didn't want to go over and take a look at all this stuff so but i did you know i did made a few things for him <laughs> so there you go Yeah, I got I got a new Astro gadget. I was gonna try it out tonight, but it's clouding up. Yeah. I got an upgraded DSE. Last okay. month at Calstar, I talked to several different people who were using this Nexus DSE on oh, okay. their Dobbs. And it sounded like it's substantially better than the Argo. So I have it, it's in the box, it's ready to go, but the clouds aren't cooperating. No. What what's you know, it look we like? We all Joe? know about that one. What's that, Tim? Well, is, is it a is it a tracking platform? No, no, it's the computer and the database. Oh, okay. So you zero it out, like an Argo? Well, it's a lot. It actually the logic is a lot like the Argo. You know, you um, align on two stars, and then it compares that measurement with a GPS reading, mm -hmm. and tells you, and then you tell it what you want to look at, and it tells you how to move the scope. Oh wow, interesting. But the Argo. At least mine, typically as the night went on, it got wonkier and wonkier. And people were saying this, this new one just doesn't do that. Huh. And it's got, it's got 22 different catalogs for just about every obscure astronomical object that you can't see. So personally, I've never really tried to observe PGC galaxies, but this has got a catalog of a zillion of them. Huh. Joe, what, what's the name of it? Nexus. 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 And it looks like that. Oh. Huh. But huh. the thing that really sold me on it was I could use my existing encoders. At least that's what I wanted to verify to now, tonight, but it, it seems the case, so... I don't think I would have done it if I'd had to build new encoder arms and mess around with all that. But in principle, I should just be able to plug it in and take it away. Hmm. Well, yeah. good luck. I hope the sky's clear up for you, for us. 
Yeah. Well, I don't think it's going to clear up tonight. No, not this all this week, according to my weather report. Yeah. Yeah. It's clear up here now. I'm going to try and I'm going to try and I've, I've been shooting with a 24 millimeter, but I'm going to try and put the NP 127 IS on tonight. Yeah. Dick, where do you live? Paso. Oh, in Paso. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know how long it's going to be good. Uh, it was good all that. The last two nights have been good. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Right. I'm planning to go to Mount Pinos next week. Hmm. So uh, usually, I mean, when it's cloudy down here, it usually means it's going to be extra dark up there. Mm, mm -hmm. So I would just as soon save all these clouds till next week, but nobody asked yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're going to clear for you. and It's going to clear. Yeah, as, as if. <laughs> there you go. Hey, if That's I could control action. the weather, it'd be raining right now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Joe, there was good. a guy that you were communicating with on the emails and he said that he had uh, a new scope. And he said, oh, yeah, I upgraded my 16. Did he ever tell you what size of scope he ended up with? No, he didn't. He left that mysterious. I know. So that guy's a funny guy. He, he actually started out as a visual observer. And then he's been doing photography. And now he's, it sounds like he might be swinging back to visual. So I'm kind of curious to see what he comes up with. Hmm. What's his name? Mirko. Mirko, no, I don't know. No, he's he lives in Los Angeles, uh -huh. and he's he's close enough to Mount Pinos that he comes up for a night, and then drives home at two or three in the morning. Yeah, and uh, he has a small daughter, and uh, so I'm kind of always surprised how he can get away with that, but he makes it work. Nice. I, what's your guess? Twenty-two inch? You think he got a twenty-two incher? No, I don't. I, I'm not going to guess because, you know, he might, it might turn out he just got an accessory for the 16 or it might turn out he bought a 20. I, you know, I have zero data. Okay. So, Interesting. Nice. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry, can I show your little focuser that you had for your camera? What's it called? It's a kiss focuser. Sure. Yeah. Let's see. Where is that thing? The town I was trying to remember that he's in is Wickenburg. Where's that? It's uh, north of Highway 10 on the way to Phoenix. Oh, okay. It's in Arizona. In Arizona, yeah. Okay. Wow. The, the part that he makes is the uh, bright blue part that sticks out to the left. The rest of it is an off-axis guider that looks like it's from Hotec. Okay. But so is that a motorized focuser? No. It's um, this knob, the, the gold the, knob. The knurled nut? Yeah, the knurled knob. That one moves the focuser in and out because many of the off-axis guiders, they have a screw thread and you put in a small camera like a Lodestar and in order to change focus, you have to screw the Lodestar in and out. And then, of course, mm. two cables in the back, they all twist up and everything. So he's developed this thing where you clamp this on the Lodestar and then hook it to your off-axis guider. And then new, moving that knob, it just moves the, folk, the guide camera in and out very smoothly. Got it. Right, it's right. Extremely handy. You avoid all the wire twisting and everything. And it's much faster and more convenient to do. And this is this big thing, the big black thing on the right, that's a uh, filter wheel for the, I'm judging from the color of the camera, it's probably an SVIG camera on the right. Hmm. So these are about, as I recall, they're about $100 each and I have two cameras that I have fitted with them. That makes it very convenient. So you leave them permanently attached to the camera? Yeah, along with the guide star for that camera. Mm -hmm. So it's pre it's pre focused. I just pop it in, and then I focus on the uh, object. When I put it in my telescope, I look through the camera and I focus the main field, and I know that the guides the guide camera is focused too. And I look and check mm -hmm. that it is. Mm -hmm. So I everything I can do to to reduce the setup time and the adjustment time. 
I try and do in advance. It looks like you lock it down once you get it focused. You lock it with two screws there too. Yeah. Maybe. Two oh screws. no, those are yes. That's what you do. Well, those those two. Yeah, that, that's what it functions as. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have a little more command and control than that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Where'd you find that, Jerry? I don't know. I just randomly on a on the net. <laughs> and uh, that's nice. That is pretty. Did you do that? No. No, that's not that's not my photograph. That's pretty. That's a good one. This was this was Jerry talking about. I think Jerry brought oh, this the, up the, the vignette or the uh, the uh, yeah the what you were talking about it being uh, uh, would you call it gradient? Yeah, a gradient when in fact it really is there. Is I guess well, that's right. This this was um, a photograph taken by Adam Block. And he was unfamiliar with this nebula and he spent a lot of time on the raw images trying to get rid of the gradient. And then uh, he checked other photographs and wider fields and realized that the gradient he was trying to get rid of was actually the nebula. It's real. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah, sent you a note on that one, Tom. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. What, neb yeah. what nebula is it? Well, I don't know. Okay. Looks well, like it's near Roho Fuchsia or something from the color and density. Yeah, right. I would say it's in that area. It, yeah, there Scorpio, somewhere in that, in this yeah. Scorpio, that area there. Yeah. I did send along a, a set of nine pictures of the um, this telescope workshop back in the day. Oh, yeah, those are good, Jerry. Thanks for sending those. Yeah, I didn't send them to everyone here because I couldn't remember everyone's email as I was putting hmm. it together last night or this morning or wherever. Can you show those, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of missed them days. Yeah. That was a Williams optics instrument, as I recall, too. That one you just showed that it was taken with a Williams optics. Okay. Yeah. So this is actually January 2016. We're testing a mirror, and Tom's trying to not blind himself, but still read the dial. And Tim's working on one of his mirrors. He's working on the same 8 inch he's working on now. <laughs> no, I don't know whether that's true or not. It is. Just really. <laughs> and he's still working on it. Yeah. It is. I was like 50 when I started it. <laughs> <laughs> there I am, turning an edge right there. <laughs> You can see it turn. It's probably because the building wasn't level. Oh. oh, interesting. Take a look. The 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 cerium there was the white stuff. That was, oh that yeah. The, that's the white stuff. That stuff was dead. I mean, that's deadly. It was like you throw it out. That's uh, William Bell stuff. Wilman that Bell. was the William. That was the Wilman Bell stuff, and it's white. And it it it's it'll just scratch your mirror. You, you don't know, have you to worry see, about that anymore. No, you don't have to. And thank God. That stuff, oh, it was horrible. And I, I ended up scratching the mirror three times and having to go back and and uh, and and go I back to it. two subsequent steps and then redo it. And every time I kept scratching it, that stuff was crap. And you sh I should have realized when you go to when you go to shake the bottle. It was just a big giant rock inside there. You would shake it for 20 minutes to get it to to dis disperse in the in the solution and uh, uh just terrible uh-huh i'm wondering if we were testing my mirror at that time i think this looks like your setup isn't it mike yes it is yeah this is a fabulous tester yeah it, this is a really good test made out of junk <laughs> no it, it was it, it might be junk but it, it just worked so well 
Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful tester. And now you can, uh, you don't even have to write things down. You just press a, a button and it gets put into Excel. Look at that. Nice donut. Nice, nice detail. Mm -hmm. So so what do you think? You think we'll be able to get back to the Broder building anytime this year? I have no From idea. Why? From what I've heard is no. The last time, the last time I talked to Chuck, he was saying that he discussed this stuff with the, the museum, and you know, there was talk like, well, maybe September, but I, I think in the entire year they're they're dead. Because I I know the uh, Raptor program out there is getting ready to restart. Yeah. Mm. I think this Zoom format of ours works very well. I don't see a reason to go there unless. We do want to do a testing of a specific mirror or something. Mm -hmm. I think they're probably complementary. Yeah. Because especially when somebody comes in with some piece of equipment they're trying to figure out. I don't know how well you could do that by Zoom. Yeah. That is handy for people. Yeah. But well, it certainly could, doesn't help people in Passive Robles. We could, um, we could go to the Broder building with our laptops and then Zoom with each other. <laughs> Opposite ends of the table, six feet apart. <laughs> but one, of, one of the things about the Zoom meeting, and I know that there was an email going around, and I never thought about it till after I thought it out a little bit further. One of the real benefits of the Zoom meeting is we can bring past members from other towns they moved to. Yeah. We have guys on the East Coast. We have guys in the West Coast, up North, there's Mike right there. You got Dick and uh, the, I mean, just different towns, and we can bring those all. And we, we used to get we used to get guys that would drive down from Santa Maria. Remember the cop that came from Santa Maria? Yeah. Oh yeah. To, yeah. to visit, and and then another guy came up from L.A. Drove yeah. up from L.A. And Paul and now, drive down from Lompoc. Yeah, and it, and they were they're constantly doing that, and it was a real pain. But this is like, it's a real benefit. That is. It has so the, advantages. It, it, uh, my wife was asking about that. Uh, so you you would have the physical part and the the other part. So if you if you guys still got uh, uh, if you were allowed back into the building, you were still doing things in the physical manner. You know, like uh, Tim doing his mirror and testing and stuff like that. Would you still be doing Zoom at the same yeah. time? Our, our groups would work in parallel mm -hmm. in the Broder building. On Zoom, we all work in series yeah. because, you know, we can't break up into subgroups. No. Hey, I, not to change the subject, Dick, you're, you're in Paso Robles, right? Where in Paso Robles? Because I've got a nephew. Oh, I live out, uh, let's see, I'm uh, east of the airport uh, on, off of Jardine Road. Mm -hmm. So you, there's Airport Road, and then further east of that is Jardine. Yeah. I've, got a, I've got a nephew that owns about 16 acres um, past Niblet. Oh. Up in the, up in the, uh, up in the hills there. Well, shoot, you should be going up there. Well. I, I think I will be. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, it's maybe not the best, but my problem right now is the searchlight. Uh, but I figure with the observatory and, you know, longer focal length instruments, it's not too bad. As long as I yeah. shoot east of the meridian, I'm okay. Huh. So, yeah. As a matter of fact, that's what I'm going to do, do tonight is start shooting with the NP-127 IS. Yeah, there you go. Pretty close. Hmm. There's the golf course, Lynx golf course. Yeah. I'm about 800, uh, let's see, probably about 800 feet from that place. Oh, I see. So, yeah, there's our place. That's right. You're almost there with the arrow. Go, go, yeah, there, right. That's the, yeah, that's the end of it right there. So if you go, go kind of like, Towards that way, that's kind of more where I'm at, right during that stretch right there, yeah. north of that. Yeah. Well, my my nephew, they um, 
gosh, it must be close to 20 years ago, we bought some land with the idea of uh, having a vineyard at, at Midlet. And uh, um, it was pretty dark when, you know, it first started going out there. Are there roads in there yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I know people, other people that have bought land in that area, and they're, the problem with it is, is there's no roads. So if you got roads in there, shoot. Well, they, yeah, he, yeah well, they, they had roads originally, and yeah. uh, um, so it's. Uh, Nick, where is that? Is, where's the Warbirds Museum? Is that right here at the oh, airport? Oh, Warbirds. Let's see here. You got Airport Road. Let's see. Pass Robles Muni Airport. Let's see, I'm trying to figure out where we got airport over here. And uh, you've got to get over. Okay, there's Dry Creek Road. So it's going to be off of that. I'm going to say you're going to be over here towards the bottom, towards the right. See, see this road right, right down here. I can't point it out That's to you. That's a taxiway. But, oh, here it is. Here it is. Not, not that that one there, but the one down below that one. You see Dry Creek Road. Dry oh, Creek is. Road is that road right there. That's yeah. where it's at. Now the Warbeards Museum. Right yeah, there, there you go. You got it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, I was I've been there for a car show. <laughs> I've never been there. I'm it's pretty have to go cool. There. It's worth taking in. And oh, you know, yeah. they're they are getting more and more stuff there all the time. So, oh my gosh! Looks yeah, like they got a. Cool. It's neat. They get F one eleven there. Yeah, it's like they got a vigilante there too. So, I mean, they, there's a lot of old, pretty, there's a lot of old cars in here too. I think somewhere. Yeah. Lots of lots of uh, one and two more memorabilia from the from the first two you know, from the World War. So, huh. it's a neat little spot. So you can take that in. There, there's a one hundred one over here. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah, most of the light is coming from the east. And then, of course, when they put in uh, Barney Schwartz, there's a big park there where it's got multiple uh, baseball diamonds and so forth. So that's been a big light polluter, too. <laughs> so that's what Yeah, my uh, uh, nephew, uh, um, he has a, a winery, Art Cellars. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a, they're all over the place. Oh, this place is changing so rapidly. There's so much more vineyard land that's been abscounded in the last five to 10 years. And, and the water table is going way down. Uh, when I first lived here, I think it was probably down about 100 feet. And now it's getting down below 300, you know, probably 300 feet. It's, it's going down. Hmm. Well, at least it isn't uh, almond trees. Uh, which yeah. requires even more. Water. Well, uh, you know what? I, I debate that uh, because the way that they're growing these grapes here is not the way that I think you should be growing them, but they're just throwing water on them. The thing they're doing here is name branding in Paso Robles. They're trying to you know, let you get people like Gallo coming up here and they're buying up the land and they're name oh. branding the wine and they just throw water on it like it's going out of style. This is all about production. It's not about uh, producing a good quality wine. There are vineyards here that are doing that, that are doing water conservation and doing the things that they should be doing to, and they, and they belong to organizations that enforce it. But there's a lot of these guys up here, they got sprinklers, they've got drip, they throw the water on there like it's going out of style. And they were for a while there, they were planting these little vines and, and they would go and they would plant these things right at uh, the beginning of the summer when you really, the ground table goes down the most. People were losing their wells. We had, you know, several people in my neighborhood were all on well and they had to have their wells uh, re-drilled. And that's a very expensive prospect right there. Yeah, my, my nephew has a, a well. I'm not sure if he had to redo it. But, What's uh, the groundwater like up there? Does it have arsenic in it and stuff? I think it's still pretty good. It's part of the, uh, what they call the Salinas Aquifer. So it's, it's just a quite extensive aquifer in California, but mm -hmm. it, it is gone down and I've heard stories, uh, not knowing any better probably, uh, about the quality of the water going down. 
I, I got to believe some of it because uh, as you take that thing down, there's going to be other pollutants that are going to contaminate the water more. And well, they're they, not going to be filtered out. They don't have any oil wells nearby to frack well, it. Well, there's one that got San Arno. And so, and that's not too far down. And it no. wouldn't be a stretch of my imagination to believe that there's probably some contaminated oils type water around here. I've talked to some of these drillers. They know what they're talking about. And they're saying, you know, you just can't just drill anywhere. You know, you can't just go deeper. It might not work out. So, uh, and, and the vineyards have come in and they've drilled all <laughs> these wells and they're putting down, down eight inch uh, casings and, you know, or, or bigger. They have eight, eight to 10 inch annuluses on some of these things. They're just sucking the water dry. Uh, so uh, there's a real trouble here for that sort of thing. I can go deeper, but not everybody else can. Well, speaking about wells, uh, back when I was living down where you guys were at Santa Barbara, when they had the, the drought conditions and they told everybody to stop watering their lawns, I used to go bicycle through Montecito all the time uh, from the tuna can. And every week, somebody on a big property where their gate costs more than your house does, um, <laughs> was drilling for water. <laughs> and, and that's what's water. happening here. Yeah. Hey, you know, I got to split. I got to go out there and take some flats and it's just about the right time. So uh, okay. thank you guys. I, I love being with you guys. Uh, see you next week. Yeah. All, All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. Good night. You, you, were, you, were, you were talking about telescopes before um, about collimation and all that. So I've got this book, Double Stars, and this is a very interesting uh, 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 I think I could focus it a little bit better. Huh. But I think it's available on, okay, this guy every night he does double star um, observation puts that telescope together. And the thing is, is that tube is not the telescope tube. The mirror is shown right next to him, right there. Okay. And he puts it together and it's- this So that, was built that by box a, structure is just a strong arm then? Strong arm. This was built by a blacksmith. This is in France. Uh -huh. And um, this is an old uh, mirror made in like 1900 purposely made under corrected, I guess. Uh, and uh, so this is what he, he does every night. Mm. He uses a, it's a 12 inch mirror and uh, he goes below the, uh, the limit, so to speak. He's, he, you know, he looks for oblong stars and makes measurements, stuff like that. So, right. so old technology Anyways, like that. I I gotta go. Good to see you guys. Okay. All right, Joe. Take yeah. care. Yeah. So old technology doesn't necessarily mean it's it's worse. Sometimes the new technologies made a little bit fragile. I mean, you know, some of these new scopes they go out of alignment like crazy. So, anyways, so Hank, your new camera. You've been do working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was on mute. Sorry. Um, so let's see here. Uh, I'm, I'm preparing for my trip mostly, actually. So I, oh. I, uh, I haven't done anything. In fact, I have uh, taken the spider out of my 12-inch uh, newt. So that's the one that has a new camera and everything. Uh, oh, kind okay. Of for that tube. So I, I haven't done that. So because uh, I was I sort of reconfigured all my astro gear. So I've got two boxes. One that has all this stuff for the AVX and for the uh, Los Mandy and the 12 inch newt and the other one has cables and what whatnot so it's quite yeah. a taking if you want to take all that with you and be prepared for visual so i i want to bring my mac newt my um uh astro what is it called astro cat no it's a red cat red cat <laughs> and uh um the 12 inch of course um mm -hmm. so yeah, hank I, why why would you take the spider out of your newtonian oh to to stuff it with uh, gear so <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I made a, a, round disc, a round disc on a rope that I can lower into the tube and then just stuff it, stuff the whole thing. Uh, well, if it's big enough, you could sleep in it like uh, Dobson did. <laughs> Not that big, but 
but it's uh, you know it takes up the whole the whole rear seat pretty much. I mean the, the tube oh. is like 14 inch in diameter, so it's a waste of space to not use it. <laughs> so, so where I, are you going? I, I, huh? So you're going to Pinos or someplace? Uh, to, no, to, to to the Kaibab uh, Lodge by by the North Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I had planned on going by myself, but I have a, another passenger apparently, so that it's extra important to, to save in all space that I can. Um, and I also practiced um, running everything from my battery. I have a, um, a small um, deep cycle battery. It's not that big, actually. It's uh, pretty heavy, as those things are. And I was able to run both the AVX and the Los Mandy for over six hours. Now I have to say, at that time, at that point in time, they it had run down to eight volt, and um, when I tried to run the Los Mandy on full speed, it started uh, hacking up. I mean, the, the, it didn't have enough power. But I could go one speed lower, and it would, was still fine. But I figured, you know, <clears throat> in the beginning, I'll probably do the, the slewing and stuff. And once it once I'm done slewing, all I have to do is tracking, so that should not be a problem really. And six hours is much more than I want to go anyway. Uh, so on most nights, I think it's probably going to be. So know. you're going to bring the, the the battery inside and charge it up and. Uh, when you uh, yeah, sleep. yeah. So it's it's by a meadow over there, um, and I I don't know if there's wind there, but um, there might be. So the 12 inch might not be the the greatest thing, but then I can switch to the Magnute. Um, and um, they, from what I heard, the guy said that they normally leave their mounts out there, so I should set the mount up once and, and pull or align it hopefully and leave it there without it being stolen and i'll take all the precious stuff off and take that with me to the to the cabin mm -hmm. so anyway yeah we'll see are you going by yourself with your passenger or is this a star party you're joining in group uh it's, it's a star a small star party so it's okay. the uh, kai bev lodge star party which is uh, part of the three star parties that they have annually uh, by the grand canyon except the other two are canceled because of covid yeah. I don't know if that was necessary because it's, it's better now, but yeah, I don't know. And I also prepared all my Raspberry Pis. I have three altogether, and uh, I made sure that I'm set up for plate solving. Um, and I've been, <clears throat> um, so I, I had to put all the index files on there. So that, that may have been part of my problem with the plate solving. I tried that with the uh, AC2600, and I couldn't get everything solved. Um, so I've... I've added, uh, there were some um, index files that were listed as recommended and I didn't have those loaded. So that, that may make a difference. I suspect it's gonna work. So uh, that works with your- um, Raspberry Pi. Your Z ZWO is gonna work with the Raspberry Pi. It, it works very well with the, um, not the ZWO, the QHY, the QHY5. Oh, okay. So that's usually yeah, not a problem. I, I, I just- uh, have to align the, the, the guide scope with the main scope, which is easy. I mean, if you're a polar aligning, you just aim it at Polaris and you know, you've know you got it. So that's not too big a deal. That, 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 works, uh, that works pretty much guaranteed. So yeah, cool. so that's good. And um, yeah, I've been practicing my polar alignment with ECOS, which was kind of fun too. So um, it takes a bit of practice, but you have to have the, the, you know, the Northern Celestial Pole pretty much in the field of view. It doesn't have to be super accurate. If it's too far off, then the, the it wants, so it draws a line from, okay, you have to go from here to there, and you want that other end of the line to be in the field of view. So that's why you have to have a decent decent initial estimate. But that, that seems to work pretty well. So I did that and uh, yeah, hmm. works quite okay. And with all my memory, time, my memory, if my memory serves me well, and I think it does, is that you were talking about or showed some pictures you did with that Mac Newt. And I thought that scope was unbelievable. It just, yeah. it, it and it was six inch, as I recall, right? Yeah, six inch. And it, it is a, a very good scope. I, I'm very happy with it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, so who I'm, made that one, Hank? Uh, that's, uh, it, they call it the Comet Hunter by, uh, it's, it's designed by David Levy and Robert, um, uh, Scott Roberts from, from. That's it. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, and it, 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 it's a really good scope. I mean, I'm not the only one who, who takes who likes it, but it's strange enough that it's not super popular, but it should be because it's really as good as a six inch Apo and, and you paid a whole, whole lot more for it and it would be a lot heavier too. I, I remember I, you showing some images that were just, yeah. they were just fabulous. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the one. And it's, uh, you know, it's pretty lightweight. It's like 14 pounds or so, so. Um, yeah, if the 12 inch is too heavy for my Los Mandy, then I'll just switch to this guy. I don't know about finding one anymore because they're, they're, I, I didn't I didn't know if they were going to 
be making any more of those, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, Orion sells a, a seven inch. That that would be next on my list. The, the problem with these Magnutes is that they have this corrector plate at the front. And so as you go, go larger in size, the, the corrector plates just become too heavy. So that's pretty much the limit, seven inch. Seven inch, yeah. I remember right. Scott Roberts when he was just starting out in the business, he was a local technical rep for me. And uh, he had just joined the company, joined me when he gave a presentation at the DCAS. And he must have been all of like 22 years old at the time or something like that. <laughs> and, now he, and now he runs yep. the company. <laughs> no, Mike didn't. Didn't when Mead had a falling out. There was some kind of I, I can't exactly remember the story, but I think Orion really benefited greatly for, from Mead going away. So uh, yeah, Scott Roberts took 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 over, right? I mean, he basically he was with Mead, and then he started his, uh, his own uh, company. Specific, yeah. yeah, he's a nice guy. Uh, he always yeah, went he to the and they contributed a lot to the to the RTMC. So they always gave fantastic prices, of which I got a really nice one, a 127 millimeter Apo <laughs> a triplet. Wow. That was, uh, yeah, carbon fiber. That was, uh, yeah, fantastic. I still have it. Um, yeah, he was I, very they, big in the outreach in the very beginning. Uh, so uh, he was yeah. always in the, uh, the, 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 when he was working for me, he was at all the events and yeah. was there all the time and dragging out scopes and showing people. Speaking of Mead, but by the way, they've just been bought by Orion, I read, so. Oh, really? Yeah, there was a lawsuit going on between uh, Mead and uh, Orion, and Mead lost, and so somehow Orion took them over. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I thought they I thought they dissolved, period. No, they were run by a Chinese company until recently. Yeah. And the Chinese company was trying to uh, corner the market or control the market. And that's where the lawsuit resulted. That's it. That's it. That's what it was. Yep. That, meant, that sounds familiar. So now Orion's got Mead. Yeah. Are they gonna Are they gonna still be called Mead or? or uh... I believe so. Oh, that's Scott. Yeah. Oh boy. You know, um, when I. <laughs> well, we all so... get older. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Because a lot of guys are we're looking for parts for meat. I wonder if that's going to really be beneficial to all these people that were looking for parts. I don't think is is meat the one that had a reputation for not selling parts at all and pissed everybody off. One of the big maybe, maybe maybe I just know that there were a lot of people looking for parts that had broken on their their yeah. SETs and they were and, they were saying where do I find this and, and that made David Rockman a lot of money. If you remember him, Astro Junk or Astro Parts at RTMC, yeah. the uh, oh yeah, he, that guy. I, I, <laughs> he's the guy that came back years after. He, he he probably bought all kinds of telescope and took them apart because he figured out he could make more money with selling parts than selling telescopes. Yeah, yeah. he he but, actually um, started out just a regular guy that just oh there it is right there. Oh boy. June 1st. Wow. That's today. That's today. Ooh. You guys are on top of it, man. That's uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I get this these news feeds. I have this Android tablet and I read my news on there and somehow that, that tablet figures out what I'm interested in. And so it sends me all this stuff. So I'm usually uh, <laughs> up to date with what I'm interested in. Hey Tom, can I show some of those Ronky grams to? Is it okay with you guys if I show please, those? Please, please. I just want to show you where I got to, and and uh, I want to also explain that when when Bruce set me up with this new LED that I got, or I bought the LEDs, and he he had me wire it with the the proper um, resistors on it. That light is bright. <laughs> it's it, it's it's so bright it's unbelievable but but you, you had a potentiometer though right tim you had a potentiometer that you could do doesn't it? matter you you can take that potentiometer all the way down and it's still bright oh then it, you it, it only goes resistance. so low what's that you need more resistance then <laughs> okay i'll add more you just need I'll to add. alter your circuit a little bit 
All right. Just add more. There's the, the, uh, the I had uh, Bruce printed me out, uh, I think on acetate. I have it right here. I think it's acetate that he had printed out using a laser printer. And he was saying that he could really get these slits printed out on this acetate really, really well. And I could use that on the LED. Uh -huh. So I haven't cut them out and put them on. I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to attach it, okay. but it's, but uh, I've, I've got it. In the meantime, I was using some, uh, I was using some brass sheeting real thin and I cut a slit in it and I'm getting all kinds of ghosting with this slit. So it's not clean. So when I, when I looking at a, at a, at a wonky pattern, it might even show when, and Tom has some of these images up, it might even show that they're they're just not clean. Okay. Um, so, so I Tim, would... Tim, are, is this? Uh, are you talking about the Ronky Graham that you made previously that we've seen we've seen before? Or no. I sent you, last week I sent you all when when we were in, in the uh, when okay. we were in the meeting. I sent you some JPEGs that I sent you, and there were like five of them. Let me see. Let me see. And you said you have them. Let me see here. I wonder if I can learn how to share it. I could try it, but I, I tried it before. I was really frightened because it didn't work. With, with your tablet, okay, maybe this is it you're talking about here. Let's see, if it was March, uh, May 25th here. Let's see, okay, let me get there. That sounds right. So one of the things I want to say is that I, showed, I sent some of these to Tom Whittemore, and in particular, Okay, the, that's older, probably. I, I don't know about that. It's, it's May 11th. Okay. This is 25th. Yeah, 25th. I sent two. I sent two of those uh, sheets. I took some pictures of the sheets, and they match up well enough to compare with the, the with the the Ronky Grams that I got now. I have yeah. one inside, one outside of that, so that you can see the banding on this. And that's important to kind of check it out and, and compare it with the uh, with the is that the 25th? Yeah. Yes. OK, so what Tom Whittemore was saying. Is that I think here it shows he says inside 50 zone is overcorrected to me. I think I look at the 70 zone. And I think that's. Well, here, this must be another one. This is a little bit more. It's not as the hips aren't as wide. This looks this looks pretty good. Looks a little narrow here. Uh huh. That looks pretty damn close. Yeah. And what 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 confused me is that you need to I take numbers. I can't tell from uh, qualitative looking like that whether you're over or under. Okay, it could be over, but it, it looks really close. Okay, this one here in particular, this is one that I really wanted to show. Kind of weird. Is it, this is the twenty fifth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This um, when Tom took a look at this, he's looking at about the inner fifty sixty zone. And he said, there's a little turnout. There's a little, it, it, there's a, there's like a, right, as you just get past the 65 zone and go outward, there's yeah. a little, there's a little turn there. There's a little jog. And he says that that jog is what needs to be um, corrected. Yeah. Yeah. And so the inside, he's saying that inner 60 zone is a little bit overcorrected. So he wanted me to use the full lap you know, and, on, the, on the right side there, the, that one that Tom's got the cursor on a moment ago, right there. See, it goes straight. That middle section goes straight. It's uh, right. right. That doesn't look like overcorrected. It looks like under. under. Yeah. And okay. I, with the other, well, the other side tends to want to straighten out. So it's definitely different. You got the, there inside and outside that 60% zone. This this image and the images 
that day, um, I think the mirror was hot. I was yeah. getting a lot of waving coming at me. Okay. And so I tried to get one that had a smooth curve that was, was going to show. So this one, so you can see how over on the left, the, the, the band that's just out from the center band, you can see how it's all wavy. Whereas the right band, it's now it's smoothed out, but it does get a little bit straight on the inner 60. Yeah. So, so I kind of agree. Undercorrected. Undercorrect? It's, it, yeah. it's not overcorrected, it's undercorrect. In the so very I, middle. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I tried to do is go back with the with the small lap. There we go. Here we go. So you can you can take a look at these. It's, it's smooth. It's real smooth in there. And then the outer band is thick. So these, these inner three bands are somewhat, they're somewhat the same thickness. It's hard to compare because your ronchigram is not symmetric. See, it's, you've got a big yeah. lip on the right and, and you've got a real small patch of green on the left. So yeah, yeah. Different. Yeah. This isn't a good, this isn't one of the better pictures. I, I think there's a better picture. I don't picture. get the image. I don't get the brightness change. There, that's a fairly that's good bottom. change. So th a, there's something wrong with the illumination of these uh, these bars because it looks different than the previous one. It, yeah. it looks like, and that makes it difficult to see if something is straight or not because some, some parts are just brighter than others. Is, is it, does it depend upon how you hold the laser or something like that? No, I think what happened here is that I was using a, a brass sheet and there was a slit in it. And what I finally ended up doing is just taking it off and I used the full LED. And so I was getting, at least I was getting clearer images when I took pictures of it. Uh -huh. And this, this is one that I thought was one of the better images. It was smoother. It didn't have any jogs in it. There was still a lot of heat coming off the mirror. So it was kind of, kind of wavy when I was looking at it. And uh -huh. I didn't particularly care for that. But I did get the right and left bands, outer bands, somewhat symmetrical in this image. And um, I thought the left out from the, from the center line, the band out from the center line to the left, I thought that looked pretty damn good. And uh, uh, it was just, there's just a little jog in the right one. So as, if you see that right one right there and on the lower section, down below you can also see that jog down below and then that straightens out there which yeah. indicates that it's just too spherical there yeah. so i try now if you go to the image that's the it, it's the um inside r where the bands are are going to give you the hips instead of this yeah that it it kind of shows to me that it, it it's going to it's going to when you're inside r you're going to get a little bit better read and inf information on the inside of the mirror and when you're outside R, when the bands are kind of going out uh -huh. like a, uh, uh, they're, they're, you're going to be reading the edges better. But it doesn't so, appear to me to be uh, a turned edge or anything like that. So oh. you're, so you're 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 getting close. And because of the, the 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 central part of it is a little off, that has less effect on your your image. Exactly. And the outer part's the most important. Yeah. You need to be making quantitative measurements at this point. Yeah. I, I know you resist that. But I do because Jerry, me. I'm just not with this setup I have. I'm going to get Tom loaned me his tester yeah. and uh, I'm going to dig it out and, and try to get some, some readings on it. Okay. Um, a, around here, it's kind of hard to set it up. Um, you need to be on concrete. Well, it's, it's just, there, there's just here. It's, it's hard to explain, but there's just no place. My wife likes to go to bed early. So when I want, when I want to test. Well, there you go. Not... You've got all night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. So anyway, those, those showed you where I'm at. I didn't exactly know where to go with it because the, 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 the feedback I was getting from these images was so inconsistent. If you were to see the, you know, the, uh, I wonder if I could do this. Let me try something. No, that's that doesn't work. I said share content. I, I hit share content and I hit photos Tom and has nothing to, to do it. What's that? Tom has to let you share. Oh. No, no, no. Pe people can share by oh, themselves. Okay. I as, think long, as long as I'm not sharing, probably. 
Well, the, the things, the things, the choices I have here says, um, it says photos, iCloud Drive, Dropbox, Microsoft One. And the photos, I hit photos and what comes up are the images for the, you know, behind me showing on the screen. Huh. So why, why can't I see the, you know, well, you, you have you a should. photo viewer um, up and running on there. Yeah, that's that's the question. You should have the photo ready to go, and then right. you should be something about sharing screen or sharing content, and then you can see that photo image already yes. sitting there. So, do I go to my photos and open it up? Yes. Okay, let me try that. Let's see what. Oh, but on, oh. the, on the on the Zoom application, <laughs> which might be might be off now, because I think the iPad has trouble running more than one uh, oh. app at the same time. <laughs> so okay, well I true. tried doing it, and let me let me just see if I can do this. No, well, okay. Wait a minute. I think an iPad uh, tablet would have trouble running two two uh, two programs at the same time. Yeah, it's just I, I just wish I could could show you guys this. It just it would it would be really good. I had a video that I was going to send you. But I was going to share, but it, you don't the have video, a PC, huh? Tim, Tim, you just got to borrow someone's a laptop that has a good laptop, <laughs> and then you'll be all set. You know they they have laptops that people are selling used for hundred bucks that are pretty pretty good. Some of them. The, the main thing today is you, you want a solid state drive. That that really makes a big difference on on laptops. Yeah, I just don't. You know, I have an old computer here. I plugged it in and I started using Zoom on it, and I couldn't get the microphone to work. I mean, I tried everything. I didn't know what why I couldn't get it. I plugged in the mic into the in, into the sound system here. They had it's built in obsolescence, I think, by Microsoft or <laughs> Apple. Yeah. So so I was back to the, you know, I was back to, to sending you all the images. But you know, some of the images that I was looking at, you know, they there was some that I thought were better. I have a I have a 34 <laughs> second uh image, I mean a movie. And when you look when you're looking at it, it changes so much. You could see all the heat and stuff like that. It's just not, mm -hmm. it's not as good as it could be. Um, how do you, how do you get rid of the heat like that on an, on your ronky images? How, what's, what's going on let there? The, you let the mirror cool. Just let the mirror oh. cool. And I have a door right next to where I'm doing this, which is another thing that's really bad because it was, it's been really blowing. So some of the, the images that I was taking, they're just, uh, yeah, I think, I, I think of, of, of the ones that I sent to you, uh, I think some of the best ones they were there. I've already showed you, so I don't think there's any more okay. to to really show you there. Yeah, yeah, and I want to let you want to let people know that Bob Richards was supposed to show up this evening and and just talk about a book for a little bit about some old images in a book, but uh, he, uh, he I guess he was having trouble with his uh, Wi-Fi or something at that Westminster Village, so maybe that's why he didn't show up. So okay. Well, maybe anyway, we'll... guys, thanks. I don't exactly know what I'm going to do with this. I'll try and take some measurements. And I was also thinking about... Make a about... checklist, Tim. Make that checklist and check them off. I'm going to You seem like you know what you need to do. Hank, I expect what? to see some great photos. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Hank, so, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's about time. <laughs> I've got... It's not the equipment this time. No. <laughs> it's, uh, <clears throat> it's me. So Good we'll luck. see. I'm so basically, you think I should work on that middle a little bit more? Uh, yes. I, no. Okay. No. I would say that you need to take data. Okay. A quantitative measure of where you are. Okay. There's too much happening that's subtle in your Ronke grams. It's okay. past Ronke. You're over the border of Ronke into Foucault. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get it done. Okay. Thanks, good guys. All right. Good evening, folks. It's been a good, good session. And... Hope to see you next week. You yeah. bet. Thanks, guys. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye.